If you would, open your Bibles to 1 Peter. We have been in a study on the burial of the soul of Jesus. Most people are familiar with the burial of his body, but not the burial of his soul. And there's a lot of teaching on it, and it surprises us sometimes because we've never heard it and we've been in church a long time. And it was a very big teaching of the new covenant. It's part of Jesus dies for our sins, is buried and raised from the dead on the third day called the gospel. And so Peter, among many passages that we'll talk about now, for those who might be visiting with us, this is our fifth lesson on just the burial of the soul of Jesus. So, if you want to, if you really want to know more about it, you can go to our website, Grace Valley Bible Study Church, Grace Valley Bible Church, and you can pick this up. I'm in First Peter three, and then we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Peter says in verse 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all. In other words, once he gets through with the cross, sin is no longer an issue. Right? right. He died for sin for, for all. The just for the unjust, what would that mean? Well, that would be 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, the just for the unjust. Uh, so that divine purpose, that's a divine purpose clause, for the divine purpose that he, Christ, might bring us to God. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now watch what he says. In the spirit, that's a small s, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. He went, to, he went to Hades and made a proclamation to the fallen angels of Genesis 6 through 9, as declared in this passage. How do we know that? Verse 20. Who once were disobedient, the spirits now in prison, to Tarsus, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah. During the construction of the ark, in which that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. So, I'm looking for the passages in the scriptures, and now we're, we've pretty much covered everything with today's lesson on that subject matter. The question is, he, he, goes, he has to spend three days and three nights in Hades, Psalm 1610. That's a messianic prophecy that must be fulfilled. Uh, Peter quotes it, Paul quotes it, he goes to Hades. Hades is the Greek word for Sheol in the Hebrew, the, the, the place where the dead goes, both the believer and the old covenant, that's where they went. The, they went to a place called Paradise or Abraham's bosom. They went, to, the unbeliever went to a place called Torment or Gehenna. In the English they call it hell, that part. And there was a place called Tartarus, the prison of the fallen angels that revolted in Noah's day uh, against Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. They tried to destroy the seed of the woman that would one day be the Son of God, will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. So, this is where we're going today with this as our, our last on a series of studies, remember this is our fifth on this very subject matter. You really, if you have any questions about it, you should go back and do an in-depth study with me on it. Um, 
there should be no doubt in your mind about this when you get through with that study, and I will take you to scripture after scripture after scripture on this specific subject like we have here today. So let's have a word of prayer. If you, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, if you believe that for your salvation, then you have the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because you live in the church age a new, under the new covenant. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Godhead. Why? Why did God send in the... When Jesus was here, he was the comforter. When he left, he said, I'm going to send another comforter, another like the same kind, deity. The word was alas. You should ask yourself, why? Why would God send the third member of the Godhead into every believer's body in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, what, don't you know that your body's the temple of God? And that word in the Greek is naos. It's the inner, inner sanctuary. It's the inner shrine. It's the holies of holies where the blood of Christ was manifested and all that stuff under the old covenant. The great ministry of the Christian life under the new covenant is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You must understand that. Uh, Paul commands you in Galatians 5.16 to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a command. It's a present active imperative of peripateo. Because that's where the Christian life is lived out. It's not, listen, you come here one or two days a week in assembly for teaching. The rest of the time, the temple of God is out there and active in the world that you live in because he lives inside your body. So wherever your body goes, the temple of God goes for ministry. That's an enormous principle of the new covenant. It's an enormous principle. So there's a warfare internally between the flesh sin nature of man, the natural nature of man to sin, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit that says don't do that. If you walk in the Spirit in Galatians 5, 16, 17, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. If you don't walk in the Spirit, you will, do, you will fulfill the desires of the flesh. Listen, he's given you a built-in mechanics for anger and jealousy and vindictiveness and gossiping and all other kinds of things that are flesh sins. They're personal flesh sins. You have a solution to those things built in your Christian faith, and that is walk by power of the Holy Spirit. You should read Galatians 5, 16, 17. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of flesh. You're either walking in the Spirit or walking in the flesh. You're, there's never a neutral, not even when you sleep. There's no neutral. So if I get into carnality, walking in the flesh and, and, and aware of personal sin, what must I do to get back into the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit? Listen to me. I must confess my sin. I can do that because I'm a priest in my own rights. You should read 1 Peter 2. You're a priest in your own rights. He's a priest, you're a priest. He's a son, you're a son. This whole thing works off the resurrection ascension of Jesus. Well, can't do it all in one day, can I? I mean, I've given you a lot of information. I don't want to overload too heavy because i got a subject. So my point is, is that if you're aware of personal sins, how do I get out of my flesh and back into the spirit who lives in me? I confess it. I have the privilege through the work of Christ on the cross and, and a responsibility of my personal priesthood to confess that sin 
and to get back into fellowship with God. In him, God is light. In him, there's no darkness. When you walk in the flesh, you're in darkness. So let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer or priest to confess your sin. First John 1 John 1.9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse it. That's your personal responsibility. When you do it, then you're back into fellowship with the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come our way to study with us in a specific subject called the burial of the soul of Christ. Where did he go and what did he do? And what was the purpose? How does it affect my life? We have spent five weeks on this subject matter, Father, and have just touched it. I pray, Father, that today you would bring this thing to an end within our studies and then people can go back to our websites and they can pick up the study in more depth for often we need to study something several times to get it. So encourage our hearts today with this message The Jesus goes to Hades to make a proclamation. What was that? And we will study it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in this study. I wrote this on your paper, uh, the First Peter 3, 18 and 20. I broke it down into a couple sections. Um, first, Christ dies for sins once for all, just for the unjust, with a divine purpose that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh. Then he talks about his burial. See, that's his death. Then he talks about his burial. See, nobody pays any attention. They all, they all pay attention to the burial of the body, but not the burial of the soul. So Peter, like many, talk about it, talking about the burial, but made alive in the spirit in which also he went, Poromai, that's going from one location to another, aorist middle participle, for those who study Greek with us, and made proclamation, made proclamation, Caruso is an interesting word. It's an aorist active infinite, uh, indicative, and it, it's the main verb of the participle. These two things are working in conjunction. He goes, uh, he goes and make a pro he makes a proclamation to the spirits now in prison. In other words, why did he go? Well, he went to make a proclamation. That's the aorist participle working with the aorist indicative. They're linked. <clears throat> the spirit's now in prison. The word in is, is a locative. It's in plus the locative, uh, a flulek, and it's, it's, a, it's a prison. That, that's the word. It's a prison. Here's what it is. It's a maximum security prison. This is the Greek word. It's a maximum security prison. And who, who's going to be there? The, sp the spirits. These are the fallen angels. How do I know? Verse 20 told me they, they came out of Noah's day, right? Yeah. Well, I didn't make this up. I mean, I sound like I did, but I didn't. I couldn't have made it up that good. Who once were disobedient. These are the fallen angels of Genesis 6 through 9. When the patience of God waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, 120, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. How many? Listen to me. Who's counting? How do we get to eight? Who's counting? Who's counting saved people? God. How about that? How about that? If we're on his team, we 
ought to be able to know about who needs to be saved and who got saved. Did you know that? Are you on his team? Of course you're on his team. Are you born again? I mean, you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised on the dead the third day? Well, our own team member, we're on team. Write this down. Second Peter three nine. God is not willing. God is not willing. God is not willing that how many perish? All right, let's look it up. I'm in First Peter. Let's go to Second Peter three nine. Shows you God's heart. Shows you where yours ought to be, mine. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards us, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Huh? God is not willing that. How many? None. So he's going to do everything on his end. He's going to put him in a right location at the right time at the right place to hear the right thing. Be with people who can explain it if they didn't understand it. Man, God does a whole lot to get one person saved. Did you know that? Well, <laughs> I know it. He moved a whole lot of pieces in my life to get it there. Then it comes down to a personal choice, doesn't it? It comes down to a personal choice. And not only does he move your life around in certain ways to get your attention, but he moves people around in your life to get your attention. And let me tell you, he should be getting your attention Is he getting your attention? And are you pushing back against what he's telling you not to do? Are you pushing back on what he tells you you should be doing? I, are you Jonah on the one hand and Thomas on the other? Well, I know what your will is, but I'm not going to do it. I can tell you that right now. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't care. Mm, how'd it work out for Jonah? That ain't going to work out any better for you. You ain't God. On your best day, you're not God. We all know what your worst day is. And so he goes, he's going to go. One of the things he's going to do is he's going to make a proclamation. This word caruso means a public announcement. Something really big that everybody in attention is going to have need to hear. It's a public proclamation. Okay? And we know who it is. I say, curious minds want to know what Jesus did for those three days and three nights in the 80s. As soon as I heard that many years ago, my mind won't stop until I got a hold of that. I went like, well, he did what? I never heard that before. Well, it's in the Bible. Oh, well, that's probably why I never heard it before. <laughs> that's probably it right there. You got me. Now, write this down on your paper, Psalm 1610. That's where the prophecy is. Peter and Paul both quote it. Peter and Paul both quote it. I don't know where Mary was that day. Peter, Paul, and let's forget it. Uh, just forget it. It wasn't worth the time to go with you. You people at your age should know what I'm talking about. Both Peter and Paul quoted Psalm 1610 as a key messianic scripture of Jesus' trip to Hades. Peter quoted it in Acts 2, 27, 31 through 36, and Paul quotes it in Acts 13, 34 through 39. Well worth your read. 
Well, I guess maybe. Well worth our read. Let's take a look at this. We, we, we have looked at this before. This is not a new passage for those who have been in the study with me. Acts, the second chapter, verse 2, I got you at 27. He's quoting, he's referring to David as a prophet, not a king. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. He's quoting Psalm 1610. If you have a study Bible, they're going to refer you to verse 31. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Right? Then you can go on and read through verse 36. It would be good for that. Then Paul quotes it in Acts 13. Remember, the key verse was Psalm 1610. In Acts 13, verse 34, I'm just jumping in there. Uh, as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David the prophet. That's what he's talking about. Therefore, he also says in another Psalms, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. In other words, he's talking about his body and his soul. He's talking about his body and decay, and he's talking about his soul in Hades. And then David, after he'd served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. And so the point is, he's not talking about, David is not talking about himself. He's talking about the Messiah, whom God would raise uh, and, not, and not go under decay. All right? So it, it's important. These are, I'm just, look, People go like, where do you find that in the Bible? Well, I'm showing you where I find it. And uh, you should read it. Okay? You should read it. Uh, Paul talks about it again in Philippians 2, 8 through 11. In verse 10, he, he says this. I wrote it on your paper. Now watch this because people miss. People read the Bible and don't study it. Every knee will bow of those in heaven, on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Right? What were the three places that that would occur? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. He mentions three places that that's going to occur. Do you see that? Well, yeah, I see that, people. Look. Every knee will bow in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. I mean, where did Jesus, where is Hades? Matthew 12, 40, heart of the earth. Ephesians 4, 9, uh, lower part of the earth. Here we have Philippians 2, 10, under the earth. This is where it was. This is where it is. All right. So here's one thing we already know. When Jesus gets there, when Jesus gets to Hades, and he went there for three days and three nights. There's no dis dispute about that. Unless you throw the Bible away. You know, you can, you can do what Jefferson, and a lot of people do. They just pick out what they want and tear it out and put it and make their own Bible. You could do that. I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend it. And, um, you get in big trouble with a man, but every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Three places, right? All right. Yes. When is this going to be under the earth? Da, 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 da. When Christ goes there. And so we know one thing's going to happen is that no matter who identifies him, Every knee's going to bow, bow and every tongue's going to confess that he's the Lord. Well, well, well. They're, they're going to say, this is the Son of God. Something like that. So let's take a look. Where, where does he go and what does he do that the Bible tells us about? Jesus told one of the thieves on the cross next to him, today you shall be with me 
in paradise. Luke 23, 43. Paradise was part of Hades. Paradise was part of Hades. There was a place identified as paradise or as Abraham's bosom in Hades. Now, go over to Luke with me. Luke 16. And in verse 19 through 31, Jesus talks about a rich man in verse 19, in verse 20, a poor man, and they both died, and their funerals were held at the same time. This is not a parable. Because you don't have people's names that can be identified by a phone book. Yeah, you could look this up in the Jewish day. You could go back to when was a funeral held and yada yada day, and was there a rich man and a guy, a beggar, a Lazarus, buried at the same time? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, a poor man, so we got a rich man, and he's described as very rich, and a poor man who is described as very poor. Um, and the poor man longed to be fed with crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores, right? That's a medical help. A, a dogs were the medical help that, that he had. The rich man, could, he could afford to get whoever was available, right? But the poor man was so poor that the only medical treatment he had for sores all over his body were the dogs who come, and he could find some comfort by them licking him. That's pretty poor, wouldn't you? I don't want to be that poor. Well, anyhow, that's pretty poor. Thank God for the dogs, though, huh? See, I'd be worried about a whole bunch of dogs coming by licking all my sores, thinking that they're thinking about, in a little bit, I'm going to have the whole meal. See, that's, yeah, see, that's the stuff that would bother me. I would go, like, ah, this, they just may be early to the party. Uh, but anyhow. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That's also called... Jesus says to the thief, that's paradise. To him, this is Abraham's bosom to the Jew. And the rich man died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. That's why we call it torment, the place where the unbeliever goes. And saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things, likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony, in torment, say, as an unbeliever. Besides all this, between us, watch this now, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, a, a great gulf of separation, so that those who wish to come over from there to you will not be able, and none may cross over from there to us. In other words, they're in a flexed, fixed place. The believer is in paradise or Abraham's bosom, the unbeliever is in torment. A gulf separates them, right? And there's some understanding between them. He said, then I beg, watch this now, verse 27 is dynamite. 27 to 31 is dynamite, pay attention. And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. Watch this. This is the guy in hell. This is the guy in Gehenna. Gehenna. This is a guy in what's called torment, the unbeliever. 
Watch what he, uh, look, look what he says. Okay, since we can't negotiate, send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that, th that he may warn them, Lazarus, so that they will not co also come to this place of torment. Boy, he is interested in missionary evangelism, is he not? But he can't do it. He's hoping somebody will do it. Listen to me. Why not you and I? Why not you and I? Somebody's got to do it. The guy in hell is praying like crazy that somebody would give the gospel to his five brothers. He can't do it. It doesn't look like Lazarus can go. So what about you and me? Why not you and why not me? He said, no, Father. Abraham said, uh, but Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let him hear them. In other words, they have the scripture. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Listen to what he tells them. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, the Bible, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. But he's pretty concerned about it, isn't he? He's pretty concerned about it. So there was a place that Jesus went with called Paradise or Abraham's Bosom. And we have quite a historical story told about that out of Luke 16. It was a place where the old covenant believers went after death to await talking about believers, to await their order in the first resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, and Revelation 25 and 6. I, I don't have time to read all these scriptures, but I expect you to do it. If I put it on your paper, I expect you to what? Read it. All new covenant believers, such as you and I, when we die, we go to the third heaven paradise. We go up, we don't go down. This will occur at our death or the rapture of the church. I gave you scriptures of 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. A second thing that should be called to attention was this idea that across from the Hades paradise was this great chasm so that the people could not go from one place to another but they knew there were two different places. Agreed? My, my daughter, Angela, gets after me a great deal. She watches my sermons. And she said, you got to stop looking like you're disgusted <laughs> with the people. How are you going to get them to come back if you give them that teacher look? She calls it the teacher look. Like. So I'm really working on it. So when I feel that kind of coming on me, I'm going to say it just to help me, okay? I don't, ex I, don't I pray that God would send you to us, not from us. <laughs> so... If I get a little nutty with this stuff, it's just who I am. I don't mean anything personal by it, but the only way you learn this stuff is you study it. You can't get it from alphabet cereals. You, you got to study the Bible. So we have this chasm uh, uh, so that those who wish to come from one side to the other cannot. Torment is where the unbelievers of the, of the old covenant as well as the new covenant go. At death, 
We know, learn this from Luke 16, 19 through 21. In Mark's account, Mark in the ninth chapter 43 through 48 calls this place Gehenna. In the English, Gehenna is called hell. The English translation, it, it, that's not true of Hades or Sheol, but it is of Gehenna. And when you read it, you will see it where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out and people are in torment. It's called Gehenna, the place of torment. When describing what the conditions are in it, they call it Gehenna. You just should know this stuff. I mean, you should know it because I'm teaching it. I don't expect you to get it by osmosis. Apparently, Jesus didn't need to visit torment. I gave you the Greek word, basanas. He didn't have to actually go visit, did he? Because if he goes to paradise, people can look across the gulf. Right? Well, they could do something there. I don't know. There's conversations going on back and forth. And they're sending notes. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it because I haven't been there. And don't tend to be. Apparently, Jesus didn't need to visit torment, but could carry on a ministry from the paradise side, according to Luke 16. And that's now. Watch this. This, this I love the Bible. I mean, who doesn't? When you start putting the pieces together from the Word of God, just wonderful things happen. For example, turn in your Bibles. Let's go to Matthew 27. I'm going to show you something about the magnificence of God in Matthew 27. People don't even, they skip this part when they read the, uh, the resurrection and crucifixion. Or they, they skip parts. I understand that. Uh, I had a teacher that cured me from reading, didn't know something, I skipped it. I couldn't pronounce it, I didn't know what it meant, I just skipped it. And uh, if you skipped a word, if you skipped something, she caught you. I mean, sometimes you could fake it, but most of them couldn't. She made you look that thing up in the dictionary and write all about it. Boy, did she cure me of that. I didn't want to do that. I looked it up before I got to class. It was a marvelous, wonderful teaching tool in my life as I advanced in my education. What a wonderful tool that was. God bless Phyllis Breening in the sixth grade. Ooh, what a wonderful teacher to my life. I don't know about anybody else's. I know about mine. Look at verse, are you in 27 now? Okay. Look at verse 51. Well, look at verse 50. Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He's on the cross and yielded up his spirit. This is, now Christ has died on the cross. Behold, watch this now. Behold, the veil of the temple, that's, that's the veil of the inner sanctuary of the holies of holies, the naos. Behold, the veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. da 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 did you read that? And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy place and began to appear to many. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, there's Uncle Fred that you buried last week. I mean, that's, I mean, you just go nuts with this stuff, don't you? Not just me. Now, the Holy City appeared to many. And now the centurion who was with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the <laughs> I love the story about the guards. And when an earthquake, things were happening, became frightened and said, surely this was the Son of God. And uh, if you read other passages, they fall over dead, like dead men and all that. I mean... 
the security guards, uh, they, they've left their post uh, unconsciously. <laughs> they they couldn't, you couldn't get them. They couldn't, couldn't bring for before the military court because they, <laughs> they went AWOL because they all passed out. <laughs> That's too funny for me. I just, I don't know. Hey, how about this though? These are people who have died under the ministry of Jesus. That, that three-year ministry of Jesus. Suppose that God in his great mercy, one of the people he sent back was Lazarus. Huh? See, that's God's heart in it. That's 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not, not wishing that any perish. Suppose that wonderful conversation of evangelism uh, from the place of the dead to the place of the living, suppose that God honored that whole evangelism idea. And don't you know when they were discussing, they said, well, I, nobody can go. No, who can do that? Don't you know God must have chuckled and said, I got my man right here. And just in just a few days, I'm going to set him loose. And guess the first place he's going to go, huh? To the five brothers of the rich man, any? Isn't that a wonderful story? I don't know. I, I don't have any evidence that he did that. But it wouldn't surprise me that God would do that. And so, it's another one of my novels I've started that will never get completed. I write about this stuff. My mind goes crazy with that stuff. I can see that in my mind. I can see God doing that. Because he's not wi willing that any perish. And he's got it all set up. These guys are having this conversation. I wish I could. I would volunteer to go. No, and he won't. <laughs> I would volunteer to go. I would go for you, Lord. If I could, I'd go for you, Lord. And he go like, okay, Lazarus. Got you, got you down, baby. Because three days from now, we're going to get this done. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. I probably have too much fun with the scriptures, to tell you the truth. Point number three, the other place that Jesus visited that's of great importance is the place called Tataris. That's a maximum security prison of prisoners in the middle of the earth. First Peter 3.19, he went and made a proclamation, a caruso, to the prisons the spirits in prison, that's maximum security of the fallen angels of Genesis 6 through 9. And Peter goes on to describe that. In Jude 6, the angels, they are described as the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. He has kept in the eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That's, the, that, that's going to be when they are cast into the lake of fire. I put that on your paper according to Matthew 25, 41 and Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6 and verse 10. The great day. In 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5, Peter writes, for if, now watch, some of you know that the if in the Greek language is really important. This is a second class if. There are four. This is a second class if in the Greek language, and here's how you should read this. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, here's how you explain, and he didn't. But cast them into hell, which is the word Tataris, and committed them to pits of darkness, reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. That's yeah, something. So we know something about his trip. 
a wonderful study for you. You should really study this because you'll probably never get this stuff laid out doctrinally, categorically, as we do here. But it's just, it's, I'm just nerdy about it. I know that. Because I'm curious about all this. What are they doing? Where are they going? Why? See? And they and the, and listen, the scriptures tell you. If you're interested, you can study it and they'll tell you. And I told you today what I've learned. This is a wonderful thing. Now, these angels in Tatyrus, right? Tatyrus. Listen to this. Mid-trib. You know the tribulation of seven years? Watch this now. Mid-trib, they're going to be released. Did you know that? And they're going to cause havoc like you can't believe the last three years and they're going to have the great war of Armageddon. Well, you say, where do you find that? Well, I, did, I get, did I write scripture? What I give you? Revelation 9 and 19. What should you do? If you have the curious mind that wants to know, well, you should read it. Got a Bible? If you don't, we'll give you one. If you don't have a Bible, listen, there's no reason to be in America and not have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you one. There's probably one in your pew. Just take it. Well, make sure it's got, got that, somebody's name on it. <laughs> but I'm sure we have Bibles around here to give you. We'll give you a Bible. Right? When we return next week, we're going back to the first Toledoth of Genesis. That would be, we have been studying Genesis. The first Toledoth of Genesis is Genesis 2-4 through the fourth chapter. See, Moses wrote them in Toledoth. I tell you that because nobody else will. <laughs> I want you to be ahead of the game, right? Tell us. So when we come back next time, we're in a, we have now studied up to the fourth chapter, and I took a break because of Easter. We have just now completed our Easter 23 special. So you want to you want to study more in detail this stuff? You should go to our website, pull it down. It's free. Uh, but we're gonna we're going to resume. I'm going to complete Taladoth 1 before I do anything else. I'm going to complete that. I'm a kid that grew up and you always finished what you started, right? So I can't leave it half done. So I got to go back and complete it. All right. So let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. Remember, this meal has been paid for by the courtesy of grace. Uh, we take it for missions and for ministry and for other things. And uh, Father, we thank you for these that have come our way to study with us today. On the burial of the soul of Jesus, who would have ever imagined? There would be so much information on it. Wow. And for me, Father, I walk away just plagued in my soul about the rich man's wanting the gospel to be taken to his five brothers who were on earth and plead with them for their souls that they may not come to this place. And he wanted Lazarus to do it. And he, Abraham says, well, that's not our call. When we read Matthew 27, it could have been, couldn't it, Father? At least it makes a good story. We need to fill that slot in our life. We need to tell other people the good news. Let them do with what they want with it. They have the freedom of volition. But they don't have, they've got to have a hearing to be able to have the volition to say yes or no. It's our responsibility to bring a clear gospel to the lives of other people. 
The Holy Spirit's desire is certainly to do it, to bring conviction of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. If we will just tell the story, if we will just give them the gospel, I pray that we'd be those kind of people in Moody, in St. Clair County, in the state of Alabama, in America, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, dear Father. I pray for that for us. In Jesus' name, amen.